don't know about the new models of senior center uh, research that's still available for NISC members, also known as NISC. Uh, so you can just go up to this website and pull that down. Uh, Dr. Parsani is sitting up front, was the uh, co-chair of that, and the co-author of an article he just remarked that in all of the uh, journal articles and everything he's written, that research is the most referenced um, that he's ever done. So it's still a very valid piece of research. Um, before I get started, too, I packed really lightly when I came for this conference so that I could get my uh, stowaway under my seat because I had tight connections getting to and from. So I didn't bring a sports coat. Um, I did bring a tie, but I didn't put it on this morning. If you feel like you're not getting your money's worth because I'm not dressed professionally today. <laughs> no? Okay, because I, I do have a tie in my briefing. So okay. I just got a sense that the flavor of this conference just felt very casual. So I just didn't really feel a need to do that today. Um, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, Bob Pittman asked me to come and do this presentation about the big thing and the summit that we put on just about a year ago in Charlottesville and the impact it's had, not really on our senior center, although that's certainly been part of the benefit of me professionally, but about how it is setting a, uh, a course of action for our community to be a more age-friendly community uh, and how we can play a leading role in that. Uh, how many folks saw Zach that big Sunday night? Most people. Like Colin Miller took yesterday. Most good. Um, I have been thrilled listening to their stories and how much they talk about senior centers as leaders and thought leaders and experts and resources and how aging is not just a quality of life and an ethical moral issue for our communities, but an economic development issue. I, you know, that's been music to my ears. That's very much what we're trying to do to help the community understand this isn't just this little soft, cushy little nice thing that you do for the cute old people. Hmm. Um, I get so tired to get me a soapbox on about when people say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a better senior center in our community? No, it's an imperative. It's a moral imperative that we have a better senior center in our community. Look at the difference that the race makes in this community. So we're going to talk about the big thing. Um, I periodically, if I remember, will reference some of the pictures because these pictures here in and of themselves are probably very exciting. I'm not sure how well you can see them in, in the, the, uh, the morning light. But I put some of them in there to help show because when we and I talk about how we wanted to reach the influential in our community, and I'll talk more about that. But I'm going to point because you probably don't recognize anybody in this picture. Do you? Now, of course, because they're leaders in my community, not nationwide. Although the gentleman in the middle of the left picture with the white hair there is Gene Corrigan, who, uh, in addition to being the former athletic director at UVA, was the athletic director at Notre Dame, the head of the ACC, and was the commissioner of the National. Uh, Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA, as the pinnacle of his career. So he is actually a world-renowned figure and still turned to in the world. Um, but colleges get in trouble, like Penn State, USC, and some others. I'm sorry for the alumni of those schools. I shouldn't have picked on anybody in particular. When colleges get in trouble with the athletic department, they turn to Gene to help clean it up for them. So he's still a very major leader in our country. But some of the people in this picture, just while I'm thinking of this one, um, on the left, just kind of cut off there, is the president of the biggest accounting firm in town. He's also the president of the Community Foundation, very influential. Uh, the gentleman there who is doing the big thing there. Um, Tuan Nguyen uh, has led several startups in our community and has started two nonprofits to build better business in our community. Uh, one thing's called the Community Investment Collaborative, one's the uh, Charlottesville Business in, uh, Innovation Council. So he's a very uh, powerful uh, business leader in the entrepreneur world. Um, there's the head of the county social services in there, um, a couple of our members, uh, the head of the free clinic, and a few other people there. And the gentleman on the right is actually the speaker, uh, Matt Thornhill uh, from Generations Matter and uh, the Boomer Project. And we'll talk more about, uh, about that. Uh, that's Leon and uh, his dog, Brandy. These are real senior center folks. We put a few pictures in just to have a little bit of fun here. So a quick overview of what our senior center is. How many folks have been to Charlottesville? I know at least one grew up there, a couple people. Charlottesville is very much a college town. The University of Virginia is there. There's a lot more to offer there, but it wouldn't be much without the University of Virginia. County and surrounding uh, County of Alabama, almost about 150, 160,000 residents to give you a scale, a size of, of the scale of our community. We were founded in 1960 um, as a grassroots organization founded by what was then called the University League of Charlottesville, now the Junior League of Charlottesville. Uh, NISC and NCOA did a study in 1964 and I think counted about 225 senior centers in the country. 
Um, it was the first census that I'm aware of of senior centers, so we were already three or four years old, so we're very much on the leading edge uh, nationwide. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we receive no federal, no state, no city, no county funding, no public funding in any shape or form ever. Anybody else in the county know the senior center's got no public funding? I'm always curious. I know one in Hershey, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Hershey, Pennsylvania, if you buy Hershey Chocolate Bar, you're supporting the senior center there, I understand. Um, and I ran into one by chance when I was in Omaha. I went over to the Council Bluff, Iowa Senior Center and found out they get no public funding at all, not a single penny. But those are the only three I know of in the country. I'm always curious if there's others. We are very much a holistic wellness center. We do not do social services. Uh, we do not do transportation. We do not do meal delivery. We do not do congregate meal. We don't do housing. There are organizations in our community that we'll talk more about that are doing all those things, and they're obviously needed in any community. So also is a very wealthy community in a lot of ways, but it's also like the rest of America. There's a lot of people getting left behind. So those services are being provided in our community. We just don't do them. So we focus on holistic wellness. For people who listened to Colin yesterday and know the ICAA, um, Seven Dimension of Wellness, that's what we hook on to, as I believe you do here, right, Bob? Um, and they do in Low Country and several other places. That's what we look at as research shows. Those are key ingredients to help you seniors stay healthy, fit, active, and independent. So as a non-governmental, non-AAA, uh, non-social service organization, advocacy has never been part of our history. We advocate for our own center to get the private philanthropy we require to provide our programs, but we've never advocated for Charlotte School as an age-friendly community, or advocated for senior issues, or public transportation, or public funding for our center. So we're very different in a lot of ways, and I think that's important to what we're going to talk about. So we've been in our current facility 24 years last week. Uh, but like most, anybody in here, their senior population, their community is shrinking. Okay, like most of America, our senior population is booming. We have about 27,000 in the last census in our greater service area. That's projected to grow to 56,000 by the year 25, uh, 2025, over doubling in less than a generation, to give you some scale in Charlottesville. So our center is bursting at the seams, and it was built very much for one generation, and we are serving a different generation today. So we have vision of building a new center. In the upper left, you see a rendering of the outside of our new center uh, in a neighborhood called Belvedere. We're gonna take the word senior out of it and call it the center at Belvedere, similar to what Mill Race Park, uh, Mill Race Center has done, uh, taking the word senior out to help uh, get around the barrier that that word has for so many other people. Uh, and in the bottom is a rendering of us, uh, very similar to the atrium here, except first it's going to be three stories tall because it's going to be almost three times the size of this center. Uh, so we have a vision, and without public funding, capital campaign, about a $20 million project, we faced a big, new, hairy, ambitious goal in our community, and really want it to be a new hub. We were talking about that in uh, one of the sessions yesterday. I love that word, hub. Uh, uh, for our community, not just for our 50 plus, but really to build our community center model. So it's, it's going to have a gym with an elevated walking track, fitness room very similar to what we have here, group exercise rooms with proper dance floors, classrooms uh, scaled up so that when you have a session like this, we actually would be in a classroom setting without the high ceiling, which sometimes can be difficult for acoustics, although it seems like it works okay here. Can people hear me okay in the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, much better outdoor space you see in the bottom right of the outdoor rendering. There's going to be, going to be a big area that we call the Commons. I love that word. I love the downtown Commons area here. Uh, there'll be a, uh, an outdoor grassy space for people to lounge in, have barbecues, do Tai Chi on a beautiful morning like today, uh, have the kids and grandkids roll around, or the grandmothers and grandparents can roll around in the grass. Um, bocce, horseshoes, badminton, any number of things. Much more outdoor spaces and about 200 seat flat floor auditorium for our growing performing arts program. So a really radically different center. And I bring that up partially just for anybody who's interested in building a big area ambitious goals. I'm always eager to talk to people who are in capital campaigns and doing things like this, even if it's not on this scale, but also because it's a critical component of what we're talking about today. So how many people in, this, in your community would you say aging is one of the top two or three issues that your community thinks is important? One, two, two out of 50. 
<laughs> Same here. I'm the, I'm in the 48, 96% uh, of the rest of you. It's just not a priority in our community. Philanthropic leaders don't think about it. Uh, our, there's 200 donor advised funds in our local community foundation. One focuses on aging, and they kick out about $10,000 a year total. So we get about 3,000 of that, which we appreciate it, but it's not guaranteed dollar. So like most communities, aging is not a philanthropic priority. It's not when people are running for city and county uh, offices. They're not talking about the age wave. They're not talking about, they're talking about schools. They're talking about kids. And when you challenge them about the growth in our population and you ask them what the age of that is, they don't even know. They don't even know that it's the older population that's really growing our community. So like most of America, that's a big issue in our community. So when we try to think about how we can get our community excited about building a new center, particularly we already have one that's fairly nice and only 24 years old, we realized that we had to get the community to understand that aging is a paramount issue. It couldn't be just about our senior center. It needed to be about why this was an imperative for our broader community. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about aging, not as an issue over here, separate from, or carving out a piece of money for that the schools don't need as much because aging needs it, because that's just not, a, it's, first of all, it's not true. Second of all, it's not a winning strategy. So we've really been working on looking at helping people understand that aging is something that impacts absolutely everything in our community. So it's a transportation issue. The picture down below is our, our local paratransit. Uh, there's an interesting, so I took that one graph, you can't see it very well, in the upper left, somebody, um, somebody mentioned it the other, uh, in one of the talks this week about how our uh, traffic signals for pedestrians are geared for me. They're not geared for an aging population. And how much of a problem that is, a public safety issue, because it's not just not friendly for a 75-year-old with a walker, it's not friendly for the mom and dad with a stroller either. So there's a lot of issues for somebody with a walker, a wheelchair, whatever it might be. Uh, it's a workforce development issue. And I almost brought this up with one of the speakers this week. I think it was Colin yesterday week about the workforce. People is one of the big strategic things. And inevitably, I know Colin knows better than this, he didn't have time to get into it so much. But inevitably, people say we need more nurses and geriatricians. That is such a short sighted way of looking about aging as a workforce opportunity. We need more personal trainers and Tai Chi teachers and yoga teachers and Spanish language instructors and volunteer managers to help connect people, and life coaches, and so many other things that we don't think about. And there's the other whole half of how we're gonna help more 65, 75, and 85 year olds stay in or get back in the workforce. Which we, many of us, particularly all of us are working in nonprofit and government human resources, how many people think they're really gonna be able to retire at 62? Yeah, not. <laughs> well, from an NJ, <laughs> most of us will have to work one and have to work much longer, so it's another issue on those. Um, so we've really sort of been setting out, uh, in order to get that language out better and that story out better, it's like, well, I can, you know, talk to my blue in the face, I'm quite capable of doing that, but we need more people to be able to do that talking for us. We need more community leaders to make that case for us. So we've been working with other community leaders, influentials, other organizations in a variety of ways trying to get that story out better, um, not just for us, but for the greater community. So could you tell us, like, Fundamentally, when you're talking to these other people um, and using language, we talk so much about senior is a you know, negative or so, so when you're talking to these other groups and they're going to pass the word on, um, are you talking about cohorts or what, what language are you talking about? So what language are we using? We talked to other groups trying to get this excited. We have been talking a lot more about age-friendly community. Okay. And we'll talk more about that as we dig into it and I'll be interested in people, what other people are doing along those lines. There's been an amazing amount of sessions around this week, livable communities, age-friendly, aging in place. We have chose age-friendly community because again, then it's not just 75-year-olds. Age-friendly community is also seven-year-olds and seven-month-olds and 47-year-olds and everywhere else in between. So that's the language that we're using today. It seems to be resonating right now. Um, and thank you for that. If people have questions in between, I think we should have plenty of time and I think we'll have time at the end as well. So feel free to raise your hand for me. So, how many people have known the book, it's just called The Influentials? The concept is about 10% of Americans run the rest of the country. And it's not just the 99% of the rich and stuff of that language. It's just influentials because you don't have to be rich. You can be anybody. You have them in your senior center, if you think about it. And it's not necessarily the president of your advisory council, a leader, just somebody by the force of their personality is the influential. 
And if you're doing something different in your community, like you're, you're changing the Congregate Meal Program or whatever it is, you better toss that in lunch and make sure they're on board because they're going to help tell anybody else <laughs> if this is a good idea or not. And it's very research-based. So when, you're, when we have a community of 160,000, we can't talk to everybody. So the point was, we need to talk to the influentials. Who are the people who are going to influence their, <coughs> the people that listen to them? So again, just some of the people in the audience there, there's the head of the Local Community Foundation, uh, the legislative liaison for our US um, congressman, uh, one of our members again, uh, the head of a, the most uh, uh, successful private geriatric um, case management business, Elizabeth, uh, head of the CBIC, the head of the city social services, head of the biggest law firm in town, um, head of the cardiology department at the university hospital. So to try and get a sense of the type of people we end up getting at this breakfast, those are the type of people that we were after, that we were able to attract. So if we wanted to attract the influentials, we talked a lot, and this, at this point was just our senior center's effort, uh, before we even figured out who to collaborate with. So who was our target audience? We really wanted to think, who are those influential people? And we really started thinking exactly who they were, not just business, we started business leaders, education leaders, and expected people who were working on child care issues, that type of thing. And then we started populating with exactly who those people are. And then we really thought, like, how do those people get, how do we get their attention? What's the hook? Uh, what is in the name of the event was really big. We have a Cracker Jack marketing person that helped us with that. We were very blessed. Uh, where and when, and I don't know about your community, but I was on our Chamber of Commerce board for eight years. And the best time to get business leaders in our community is 7.30 for breakfast. Once they get in the office, you'll lose them. They might say they're going to come to lunch and they get way late. Come to a 5 o'clock reception, they get way late. Get them before they get in the office. So we did end up doing a breakfast. Um, the budget, we tried to figure out what it's going to cost to get the space, the speaker and whatnot, how we're going to pay for it. And we really wanted to make sure that it wasn't just a one-off, that people went and had a nice little talk and that was it. We really wanted to be thought-provoking, something that was memorable, something that would create some buzz going down the line. And we really wanted also to have at least some call to action, which is really hard for a big group of people in an hour talk. But we really wanted to think at least there was something in the end that wasn't just, oh, that was interesting. But really, what, is, what does this mean to my community as an intellectual community leader? <coughs> How many people saw Colin carrying around next to the pounds? How many people have been on Colin's back doing it? There we go. <laughs> Uh, I show that picture, uh, and that's actually uh, the head of our local uh, Colonnade Senior Sunrise Living who sponsors our accreditation all three times. Um, and that's at our accreditation celebration back in February a year ago when Colin got Mark on his back. I bring that up because originally Colin was going to be the speaker at the Big Bang, um, February a year ago. And Colin's from Vancouver, which also is a little way away. We were going to do it in February because that's our anniversary month. And Colin made it, but it snowed about a foot, which in Chicago doesn't slow things down, but in the South, everything shuts down. So we had four events planned for Colin, a dinner, a breakfast, a lunch, and the accreditation celebration. The dinner, the breakfast, the lunch were all canceled. We only got the accreditation celebration. But we were going to have him speak at the big thing was going to be the breakfast. We just had it canceled, just couldn't do it, which also shuts down. But a month or two later, people started like, aren't you going to redo the big thing? That was a real idea. I really want to do that. The name was catchy. I, the speaker, aren't you going to do that again? We actually had not planned on doing it. But the community started telling us about it. Our staff started talking about it. So we ended up going back to the drawing board and saying, you know, what is this event going to look like? And that's when we really thought about it not being a senior center event. We very much wanted to get our AAA is called JAWA, the Jefferson Area Board for Aging, although they do not, like ARP, they no longer even call themselves. They call themselves JAWA. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about relationships with AAA, but real quickly, how many people, okay, on um, a scale of 1 to 10, 10 is great, how many people have an 8 to 10 with their AAA? And if you remember your AAA, you can say you have a great relationship. <laughs> okay. Um, 4 to 7, middling relationship with your AAA. 3 and lower. Not too many. Okay, it's so fairly many, that's good. Sometimes it's a lot worse. Our relationship with our AAA was cordial but their CEO was extraordinarily powerful and didn't have a lot of room for us for about 30 years. Um, that changed, he retired, and we had a breath of fresh air with the new director, and if anybody knows the former director, I do not mean to speak badly of him. He was extraordinarily accomplished, but 
you know, you played by his rules or you didn't play. And that, you know, that's the way it was. So we had, uh, we wanted to get Java involved. ACAC is our private fitness and wellness club in our community, very powerful, and has a very hip, young, healthy, well image. And the University of Virginia has an institute on aging that's a pan school, not just a med school and a nursing school, but architecture and everything else. We wanted to get them involved. How many people know Matt Thornhill uh, and the Boomer Project and or Generation Banner? Ever heard of them? They have a lot of name recognition, um, but Colin Miller doesn't outside of our field either. But we went, I, I really didn't think I could go and ask Colin again to fly all the way 3,000 miles and everything that he did for us in a favor and do that again. So we went to Matt Thornhill, who is from Richmond, an hour away. Again, not a big name recognition, but he's got a resume very similar to Colin. He's been on all the major TV shows. He's been quoted by all the major periodicals. He, they do work for Home Instead and AARP and Wells Fargo and, and things like that. So. Well, you may not recognize his name if you get an invitation to say who this guy is. Like, hey, he knows what he's talking about. I also know him to be an excellent speaker, as Colin is. Very energetic, very thought-provoking, very research-oriented, very funny, very memorable. Uh, so that, that was the kind of concept. We came up with this, the big thing. And the big is personally, you know, capitalized on B-I-G. That's not a typo in the program or anywhere in the PowerPoint. Because we wanted people to think big, we wanted to help people understand aging is this big overarching issue. We wanted it to be thought provoking, so things certainly fit. Uh, and then uh, Matt really added the subtitle, Is she also ready for the age shift? And the age shift is another to language that uh, Matt used a lot that we've been working. It doesn't just show talking about the age wave, which is what I've used a lot and I still do use at times. But it's, it's not just that there's a lot more older adults, but the age shift about how many fewer younger people there are. Really helps people understand the chain. I'll show you a slide from that here in a second. That doesn't show up real well, but that's just the invitation uh, that we had for the event. So it was sponsored by the Senior Center and Java um, for breakfast uh, almost exactly a year ago, September 25th. In fact, doing this presentation, putting it together, I was amazed that it was only a year ago how much has happened in that short period of time. So the format of the event uh, we wanted to have it not at our senior center, even though we can accommodate. We always love having events at our center to bring people in and show what we do. But we really didn't want it to be more of a neutral space, more of a community space. We wanted, since there was partners, for it not to be. When you have a partnership and you have it at your center, it doesn't feel as much like a partnership. So we really wanted it to be a, a more community-oriented space. Um, Charlottesville is growing in a lot of ways, but downtown is still the heart and soul of Charlottesville. It's where City Hall, it's where our county office building is, where the courts are, where the business people are, the chamber. It's still where people convene, so we want to kind of be centrally located. The picture in the upper right is the Jefferson School City Center, which is actually a historic African American school that had shuttered for 20 years and had just reopened about a year earlier as a community center. It's got, Java has a small, community senior center there, there's a little garden cafe, there's the local community hospital public health center, um, literacy volunteers, YMCA has child care there. There's a lot of different things going on in there. So it's a very neutral, active, and it was kind of a new space some people still hadn't been to. Uh, and the uh, site in the center there is actually the hall, the African American Heritage Center, the auditorium from the old school. Beautiful, beautiful original um, woodwork in there. So very nice hall. And in the bottom right is a picture actually of Mart on the left, of, uh, head of Java, and uh, Diane on the right there, who is the sole decision maker for a $100 million foundation community. Kind of important to us. So we're glad to have her there, there getting the uh, breakfast buffet. Uh, and actually, I had only met Diane in passing before this event, and we just had a two and a half hour coffee date last week, so that was the start of a wonderful friendship. Hasn't made a decision about a gift yet, but we get it. Uh, we made it free, so there's no barriers. We didn't want to charge anything. Uh, and we got sponsors, uh, had information tables at the event. So the budget, these are two representatives from ACAC, uh, the Private Fitness and Wellness Club, that actually underwrote most of the cost to get their name on it. The owner is very into aging uh, wellness, so he was very prominent and very easy to get into this. He's actually about 70 years old himself. He made his money uh, running an educational tour business, getting seventh graders to Washington and back safely for uh, social studies teachers all over the world. Made a fortune doing that and then got interested in fitness and started fitness clubs as kind of his hobby. Um, 
interesting guy. So he uh, is very interested in the age wave and different things. So he hosted it, I responded it, and those are two of his team. Uh, Jefferson School City Center, because the community center, there's a collaborative expectation, it's actually in their leases at that community center, they have to collaborate. So the um, African American Heritage Center as a favor of Java, uh, waived the rental fee. Don't tell anybody, that's a secret. <laughs> Figured it's safe here. But I don't say that in Charlotte School because they don't want people to know they give that away. Um, the Vinegar Hill Cafe was a program of Java. They provided breakfast buffet as a gift in kind. They underwrote that cost. Um, our team did most of the leg work. Javas did a lot of the marketing work. Uh, in fact, most of they did all the photos, which means all the photos typically are marred with famous people, not me, which is fine. Um, the Omni, which is our uh, uh, landmark hotel right a block away, uh, gave a discounted room for Matt for the night before. So we got a lot of gifts and kinds. I know everybody is used to doing that. But so the overall cost ended up only being about $4,000. Matt also gave us a good rate. I actually am not going to say what that was, but it was a very good guy rate because it was uh, an easy trip for him. Uh, and he believed in the cause. So the whole thing cost about $4,000 um, all in. So it was a pretty good rate. That's Matt speaking up there. So I'm used to having my laptop here so I can look at that instead of the screen, excuse me. So what happened, so we had about 150 people there, which actually ended up being standing room only. We had to put up chairs around the circle and some people still had to stand, which was a good problem to have. There were some people who were willing to stand. Uh, Matt made several good points. Again, and if you ever look for a speaker, I highly recommend Matt. He's very knowledgeable, very thought-provoking, very funny. He's got great slides. Uh, he emphasized a lot the age, the, the age shift. It's not just the age wave of older adults that we talked about. Uh, he talked a lot about age-friendly, not just aging. That's some of the language he uses a lot. Uh, he talked about old people will be good again. He showed pictures of, you know, back in the day when Mark Twain and Benjamin Franklin and people used to be revered. He really believes that that's going to be hot again. Um, Colin made a lot of those points yesterday. How you know, older models and whatnot are becoming uh, more the do and more again. Have a long way to go, but some progress. He believes that's a, a trend that's going to continue. He very much talks about um, economic development. And he talks very much, this is very, I love Zach Benedict Friday night. He talked about this. When the studies show the old model of economic development, I'm going to go pull an employer from your community and bring them to mine to get jobs into my community. Still happens, but is really kind of old school because what's really happening is you've got to create a great community because the millennials and the boomers, the two biggest populations and the most mobile, <coughs> who want a lot of the same thing urban, walkability, public transportation, cultural life, volunteer opportunities, want the same thing. They're going to find your community, and particularly the age of the internet. You just do the research and says, you know, Columbus, Indiana is the place to be, and people will flock to it. So he talks a lot about that, um, particularly of the commonalities that the two generations have. Um, and really emphasizes that um, the biggest startups are also those two generations. We all think of the startups being the 18-year-old Stanford dropout in his garage that starts the big new IT thing, which does happen. But the second biggest startups in our country are happening from 50 plus. It's like 26% during the recession were started by 55 plus. I think. Don't quote me exactly on that, but it's a huge number. Um, and that's another whole session that we want to talk about. Um, so this, again, doesn't show real well. You can't see the details. You can get the picture. Uh, in 2010, on the top, that's the age uh, breakdown in America today, with the youngest on the bottom and the oldest on the top, male on the left, female on the right. And you can see, you know, the last census, there's still a lot more people under 10 or 15, and it's, the, and it's a pyramid, which is what it's been every time since people looked at it. And then you see in 2030, it's almost a rectangle, and by 2050, it's very much a rectangle. It's like an Empire State Building going up. So it's not just that there's more older adults, but a lot fewer younger people as well. So one of the things when we talked to Matt, Matt, and what I liked it too, is while he has certain information, he's got a lot of different things he could do, and we talked a lot on the phone about what do we want out of the talk, and what he could provide, and as he then dabbled with it, he sent us samples, and we talked back and forth a little bit, which I really appreciated. Um, and one of the things we again talked about is like, we want to have a call to action. We want it to end with you saying, here's what Charlottesville needs to do to be ready for the age shift. So he did, and some of his key points, age wave planning uh, needs to continue to do, but he really emphasized about shaping, not dramatically changing regions. Uh, 
Uh, getting everybody involved in the plan was very much what we wanted to hear too, because that's we wanted the people in the room to think, I need to get involved as a business leader, a government leader, uh, whatever it may be, an urban planner, an architect, that it was relevant to me to get involved in this age shift. Needing to track the boomers, the millennials, he was very convincing. And in our community, he talked about Lexington, Virginia, Richmond, Fredericksburg, Williamsburg, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, other mid-Atlantic college towns, and how they are really doing things to make sure that they're ready and eager and welcoming these millennials and boomers. He says, if you don't follow suit, you will get left behind. This is a competitive field, and if the communities are not proactive about it, you will lose. And I can tell you, I was paying a lot of attention to looking at what was responding, how people were responding. That not particularly the bankers and the accountants and the chamber of commerce, the community manager, people's attention. Um, he's talked about holding a place-making summit. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, building community dialogue, thinking multi-generational, which I know almost all of us are doing these days. We certainly don't want to talk about that this week. Uh, and he talked about nurturing the existing infrastructure, the university, the community hospital, our chamber of commerce, our senior center, our job of but really also how those organizations could meld more with some of the things I mentioned, this is the Community Investment Collaborative, which actually helps teach potential entrepreneurs how to do a startup business, whether it be a restaurant or a, a salsa making, whatever, a consulting business. It helps people do kind of like SCORE does, but in a more structured way for people of all ages. Um, the uh, community, uh, Charlottesville Business Investment Council, CBIC, that is helping with biotech and other startup businesses. Now, how can we make sure we're nurturing those organizations that are critical to economic development? So again, that's how most jobs are starting today. We're not, you know, big business doesn't start as a big business. It starts from entrepreneurs. So it's very aligned with what we wanted to hear. It was very thoughtful both and call to action. So outcomes. Uh, that's actually a picture of uh, Matt being interviewed by one of our local TV stations. So both TV stations came uh, and did feature stories and talked about the age shift and Matt and John and the Senior Center working together to bring this attention. Uh, that's not easy to come by in our community. Our local TV stations also still kind of want to talk about the car crashes and the bar fights and the things that happen in any community. So a really feel good story is not the norm. We were happy to get that. Charlottesville Tomorrow um, is a nonprofit news organization. You might be familiar with these concepts of micro neighborhood and micro community news organizations that aren't looking at what's happening globally or even statewide, but just what's happening in your community. They focus on planning, zoning, placemaking, public transportation, these kind of issues in Charlottesville Alcohol. They're very focused. They've won national awards from the Knight Scripps Foundation about being this new nonprofit model looking at these types of issues. And the thing about Charlottesville Tomorrow, they hit both the influentials, it was founded by two of the most powerful people in our community. The board is the dream that all of us would have of who's on their board. And when you talk in Chamber of Commerce in different circles in our community, people reference Charlottesville Tomorrow. That's where people get their news. So the influentials pay attention to it. And they just signed a few years ago a contract with our local daily newspaper where they give all their content also gets into the daily newspaper, so it's also got the shotgun uh, impact of news. So they um, we'll talk a little bit more about Charlottesville tomorrow, but among other things, uh, Marta and I from Java were asked to part, uh, present to the Charlottesville tomorrow board of directors earlier this month, and we're hoping that they're going to start even more coverage about how aging, not as a separate issue, but public transportation, zoning. In our community, you cannot build an assisted living without a special use permit. By right, you cannot do it. And that's the biggest risk for a developer, buying a piece of land and not knowing if I can develop it like I want to. And nobody knows why that is. I mean, there's, there's, every community's got these different issues about zoning and policy and whatnot that can make it an age-friendly community or not. So I'm, I'm actually gonna, I don't think people can see this very well. So this, uh, and actually it's a great shot in March. You well, can't quite see, there's snow in the background when I'm in shirt sleeves. Uh, that's Charlottesville's winter. Uh, so Charlottesville Tomorrow ran a feature in the Daily Progress, Sunday, March 22nd of this year, top fold front page, which if you pay attention to the newspaper, that's what people want, the most prominent spot, on the age wave, on the age shift, several months after the event. As an explosion in the number of people over the age of 65 looms over the nation, 
leaders in the Charlottesville area, senior community are hoping the creation of, a, of walkable neighborhoods and attractive urban places can help increase the quality of life for all. The age wave is not something that's going to happen in the future, said Peter Thompson. We're in the thick of it and we need to pay attention to it now. Job <coughs> CEO Marty Kane added, we're trying to prepare and I don't think there's an overall awareness of how big the age wave is. We have to be more aware of accessible housing, affordable housing, and transportation accommodations. So this is again just this kind of general awareness that we weren't getting these stories in the newspaper a year to five to 15 years ago. We couldn't get any attention in the media about aging as an issue unless it was a crisis type of situation. How many people did stuff at the White House Conference on Aging, listening sessions are related in their community and their centers? Good, about 10%. So we, uh, did ours with Java. We actually did ours in the senior center this time, but we did it in collaboration with Java. Uh, we had Marta actually moderated a lunch panel. We had about 200 people in and out through the day for different parts of it, but I don't know how many people sat through the whole day. Yeah, it was a little tough to sit and watch a webinar with the talking heads all day long. It kind of zipped in and out and whatnot. But we had the most people during the panel at lunchtime where we had Brad Sheffield, who is a member of our county supervisor, the head of our fair transit organization. Uh, Kathy Galvin there in the middle is a member of our city council and is a uh, urban planner and architect by trade. And Dick Lindsay on the far right, who was the, is the professor emeritus for the head of geriatrics at the uh, university and remains all over our region um, trying to be a, a, a talk about aging. Um, he's well into his 80s and sharp as a tack uh, and very fit, just an amazing guy. So Charlottesville tomorrow was there. They were there all day. Um, they did another feature story on the White House conference. The one was that June or July, so just a few months after the March story. Uh, panelist Kathy Galvin, city councilor, commended urban design that clusters commercial development areas and they're walkable and bikeable. I work to create environments that are conducive to living a long life. This means creating places where people can be active. There's no reason people over 60 can't be riding bikes. She's known for being a bicyclist. She doesn't have a car. Um, to create independence, we need to consider physical design of places. So she's tying urban planning and designing <coughs> to being an age-friendly community for us. Uh, Brad Sheffield, uh, County and John, it's interesting to see through my kids' eyes, says Sheffield as teenage children. They see the value of the older generation and provide them with the opportunity to interact with older adults is really important. I don't think it's going to be, I don't think I'm going to have to force my kids to volunteer at the senior center. I think they're going to enjoy that. So these are the type of again, stories that we just weren't getting in our community beforehand. Uh, Michael Guthrie, AM 1070 News Radio, that is the news leader for talk radio in our community, locally owned radio station. Uh, Michael's the owner of CEO of our biggest real estate uh, firm in town. And he does a show called Real Estate Matters on uh, Saturday mornings on AM 1070. Uh, Michael Guthrie Radio Show, Real Estate Matters, was awarded first place best documentary for public affairs by the Virginia Association of Broadcasters when he interviewed uh, Matt Thornhill right after the big thing. He said, this is a story I can tell. He got Matt to come on his radio station and won a uh, documentary program for conversations on aging with Matt. So, and, and uh, Michael is a social network extraordinaire. I mean, Twitter, everything. So he took them out. It's all over the community this summer when he won that award um, to talk broader about aging. Other uh, outcomes, community engagement. I know a lot of this is natural for you all because you do it for your funding and whatnot, but again, it wasn't as uh, typical for us. And very much was not. Java does get involved in government. Java has a relationship with the public officials because they're relying on the biggest funder. But having Java and the senior center working together to talk to our public officials was really brand new. Our local economic development authority actually called and asked me to come and present to them about our age shift as an economic development issue in our community. That type of thing has never happened in our community before. Now there's another, there's a person on that that also has interest in us getting EDA bonds to build our new center. There was a little bit of an extra piece and this one I did by myself because of that. But that kind of thing just has never happened. And I got about 20 minutes in front of the EDA board. Uh, we'll see where that develops. I don't have about a month ago. Uh, our county supervisors were doing a workforce development um, summit, uh, uh, brainstorming at the uh, retreat from the county supervisors. And of course, they invited the local community college, which is all about workforce development, KTEC, our local uh, technical educational center, 
And the third person they had come and talk about the workforce development community was me. Because of what I we were just talking about, about workforce development as an issue, both of a supply and a demand issue. That they just hadn't thought about before, but Jane Dittmar, the head of the supervisors at the big thing, made her think, made her realize there's a resource right here in the community to come and talk about. It. These types of things just never happened before. Charlottesville, and Charlottesville and Alamore, Virginia is uh, terminally unique. Our cities and our counties are entirely different entities, even though the city is surrounded by the county, they have nothing to do with each other. Totally different government entities. So going back and forth about Charlottesville. Charlottesville has a place design task force which stands for place making livability and community engagement. Um, the head of that was at our big thing on purpose, of course. Invited Marty and I to come and talk about how, again, the age shift integrates with what they were talking about. <coughs> Walkability, public transportation. Um, Charlottesville and Alamo are both doing these uh, small area plans. So they've got a master plan, but they realize that the master plan, when you drive it down to a particular neighborhood, is really hard to, um, to make it, them speak to each other. So they get these small area plans, and they get the business leaders, the community leaders, the neighborhood leaders together to look at that. But they have not been inviting aging experts into those conversations, unless the neighbors are experts in their own experience. So some of these things are happening now in our community. Um, and our comprehensive plan, again, Zach, I think, was talking about every community typically has a comp plan of some kind. And it guides everything. If you're not aware of it, I encourage you to get knowledge from what I call comp plan. And how is an age-friendly community in there or not? Uh, our comp plan for our county is about 150 pages. I went in and looked at the one that, the last one that they were just rewriting, and senior and aging showed up and you do a quick fine three times in about 150 pages. And it was all just about public transportation. It wasn't in housing, it wasn't in recreation, it wasn't in economic development, it wasn't in any other section of the comp plan. It is now all over the comp plan because Java and us made a point of it and made a relationship so that our elected officials were directing the staff who was writing it saying, you need to do more about this, you need to talk to Mark, you need to do it. I actually wrote sections of the comp plan this year which really bothered that. Because some of it didn't even get edited. I mean, I just wrote what I want. Wow, this is easy. Uh, other outcomes, um, Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission, which oversees um, Charles Lauber on six other counties in our area. Uh, we had, had done age weight planning several years ago. The upper right is the image of our Action 2020 uh, plan that actually won a lot of national awards. Java initiated it and led it, and it was frankly very Java-centric, but there was a lot more to it. Um, but it got more of them over time because they couldn't keep it alive. I would argue it's because Java led it so much there wasn't a lot of community buy-in to get it done. Um, but it just was sitting on a shelf. Nobody even knew about it. The new head of the AAA didn't even know about it. Um, so our planning district commission, after the big thing, said actually that day, was talking about, I said, what happened to that Action 2020 plan? Shouldn't we be reviving that and seeing this? Because the point was, it was 2020 vision and what the community's gonna look like in 2020, which is now not far away. So we are reviving that at the request of, uh, behest of the uh, TJPDC. Our local health district, and I'm sure this happens in the community, and many of you, I suspect, are involved in it, but they do similar, they do mapping. Uh, what is gonna be the major public health issues in our community? Aging has not been on the radar. There have been some areas, obesity, smoking cessation, that are relevant to older adults, but not core to just the fact, like the CDC says, that the aging of America is one of the biggest public health issues we face. Overarching, there's not just a diabetes or a hypertension or arthritis and Alzheimer's issue, but the whole aging is a public health issue. Um, not on the radar of our local uh, health district. Uh, but we have been invited to the table for the first time to be part of the next five of the planning of what are the major public health issues in our community. Uh, and the Daily Progress, again, the media coming back. So they were doing a story on Charlottesville Tomorrow for the Daily Progress on child care and senior living communities and potential for synchronizing. Now, we don't do adult daycare. We don't do adult housing. We don't do child care. We don't do any of that. But they called me for a quote on it. Like, I, we don't do any of that. So, but you do civic engagement. I want to get your perspective from the senior center about aging. So I won't read that whole quote, but it just, it gave the opportunity for, um, that, for seeing the senior center and us as a resource about issues around aging, even outside of our normal comfort zone. And that's one of the pictures of one of our uh, volunteers, Mark, working with 
hiding, teaching her how to uh, how to knit at one of the local schools. So somebody had asked earlier, and I mentioned about age-friendly communities. How many folks are aware of the Milken Institute's rankings of age-friendly communities? They call them best cities for successful aging. One, <laughs> two, three, maybe four, five. Um, how about the World Health Organization and ARPS Age-Friendly Communities Initiative? Better. Okay. But still less than half. So this is what livable communities aging in place. Bob Blancato talked about this at lunch yesterday. The challenge is there's all these different terms, there's different standards, there's different people doing it, and there's not a real commonality, particularly at a public policy level, that he's very concerned about, that nothing's going to happen until the federal policy level says, here's the standard that we are going to ask you to try to get to, and then money's going to flow to that. I'll let people that are smart about federal public policy worry about that. But things that we're looking at a lot is looking at both these. So the Milken Institute, there's a link there, and again, this you don't, you don't need to pull this down because it is on the, um, the website. I don't know if it is already, Bob, all these. Uh, Not yet. They, so they will be. This whole um, site, including my contact information, this whole deck will be up there. Um, but they, uh, the Milken Institute, talked two important unassailable facts. I love that. Two important unassailable facts underpin our best cities and successful aging. Our nation is aging in an unprecedented rate in a titanic shift that is creating the largest older population in history, and these mature adults live predominantly in urban settings. A product of lower birth rates and increasing longevity, this phenomenon is changing the landscapes in the United States and in the world. 252 small metro areas ranked. Bob, you may be number six in architect, but 100, 200, 172. I don't know why. It's awful walking from me. I didn't dig into it. Charlottesville's ranked 22. Charlottesville doesn't settle for 22. We're not number one, our community gets really upset, so we have a long way to go. Um, World Health Organization started AARP nationally, is picking it up in the United States. Uh, AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities helps participating communities become great places for all ages by adopting such features as safe walkable streets, better housing, transportation, access to key services, opportunities for residents to participate in community activities. I like that they add that in. So many times that's just seen as a soft, touchy-feely type of thing, and we all know, I love hearing that this week too, you know, isolation kills. You need to have seniors engaged. You need people of all ages engaged. Well-designed livable communities promote health and sustain economic growth, and they make for happier, healthier residents of all ages. These, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff, because the two things I like about this, about both these, is they have standards for you. So if you want to try and figure out what an age-friendly community is, or a livable community, you don't have to figure that out if you don't want to. They've done it for you, and they've got ways to rank with scores, and you can be able to look and say, here's why we're number 22 instead of number one, or whatever you may be. And there's, there's uh, rankings for large metro areas, too. Uh, these, I think, have a lot of potential. This has come up in conversation over the last year from the big thing of people saying, well, how do we know what an age-friendly community is? This is what we're pointing off to our city and our county and our local community foundation, which is extraordinarily powerful in our community in good ways. They promote philanthropy. While their DAFs don't focus on aging, they have a new CEO also with a bunch of organization. Their annual report that has just gone to bed and will be published next month and goes to the most important philanthropists in the community and a lot of other powerful people. For the first time ever, they've never done a focus on an issue in their annual report. They're doing it this year for the first time, and an age-friendly community is the first one they've had. I mean, when we first when we first got the call to come and talk to the CAC staff, staff and their PR company about this, I mean, you literally saw one of these prank calls. Like, no. <laughs> is this my wife? You know, you know how important this is. Come on, Barbara. Um, and this is a quote from Brennan Gould, the director of the program. The big thing of that elevated the discussion around the quickly changing age demographics in our area and the importance of thoughtfully working, thoughtfully working toward building an, independent, an intergenerational community that values the contributions of all citizens. As a grant maker, we appreciate being involved in this event and look forward to working with partners on strategies to further develop an age from the community. I can't say all of this came out of the big thing. But this is the kind of thing, the impetus that it got, the energy it got in a thought-provoking, action-oriented way to get the right people in the room for them to actually, within a short year, to do some rather significant things. 
Um, and CACF is going to also not just have an annual report and then be done with it. Their intent is then to spend the next year convening around this and talking about this and encouraging their donor advised funds to make gifts. Because like most <laughs> community foundations, both the money is actually in these donor advised funds. The actual community uh, account is relatively small. That's where big bucks come out of, millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars. So there's a lot of potential coming out of this. Who's heard of the Tom Tom Founders Festival? Oh, you will. Who's heard of the South by Southwest Festival in Austin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the South by Southwest never nobody heard of it years ago. The Tom Tom Founders Festival is Charlottesville's uh, uh, following that lead. Um, Tom Tom, Thomas Jefferson, if you didn't know the connection. Uh, and Buffalo is a nod to uh, the Lewis and Clark exhibition and the thought of founders and exploration and taking risk as Mr. Jefferson um, asked Lewis and Clark to do 200 years ago. Um, <coughs> but the Tom Tom Founders Festival is about entrepreneurs. It's like I said, if you know South by Southwest, what do you think about South by Southwest? What age group do you think is hanging out there? 65 year olds, 85 year olds, 25 year olds? I mean, it's entrepreneurs, it's music, it's rock and roll, it's technology, and people think it's, it's, it's where the hip youngsters are going. And that's true for Tom Tom. It's very much geared towards those folks. We made a point of having Paul Breyer, the founder of the Founders Festival, come to the big thing, <clears throat> and he invited me to some of the roundtable discussions that he was having about what next year's event would be, and he ended up having me on one of the panels to talk about encore careers, and this, uh, which is a particular area about workforce development, if you're not aware of, it's older adults who are no longer excited by their career and want to do something more meaningful, like be a senior center director. Um, <laughs> second year of life. Good luck with that. Um, but uh, so you know, having me on the agenda of the Tom Tom Founders Festival, that's about hip entrepreneur workforce thing for youngsters and rock and roll outside, was a real major change of, of, of pace. That was last April. Um, UVA Baptist School of Public Policy and Leadership, the first new school the university had in 50 years, um, uh, helping people get interested in leadership and public policy at the University of Virginia. A $100 million gift from the Baptist family. Mission of the Baptist School, and I'll just say why this is relevant. The mission of the Baptist School is to develop leaders and generate new knowledge to solve the world's toughest public policy challenges. Training policy analysis and critical leadership skills the school and faculty develop effective and ethical leaders to promote a better society. Produce research addressing the most important policy problems. Serve as a model for transforming public policy education. UVA is a preeminent university, and it is attracting the students that go there for undergrad and grad are just mind boggling. If you ever get frustrated and worried about where the world's going to go, go to a great university and meet some of the 20 year olds that are going to lead our country. It's pretty amazing and inspiring. The reason I bring this up. There's a class, um, 4740 philanthropy. Uh, this guy, the faculty, uh, gets a $50,000 grant from foundation that remains anonymous to the public. Real money to teach a class about philanthropy, and they give $50,000 away in the Charlottesville community each year. I found out about this a few years ago through our network, went to talk to the guy. I said, well, how do they pick the issue? Out of all these issues, they don't have a lot of time, and they're not in the community. So why give them? areas of interest to narrow it down. So how do you do that? So I talk to the city, the county, the United Way, and the Community Foundation, and they tell me what the most important issues are in the community. So, so in five years, how many times has aging come up? Never. Because none of those groups at that time were looking at aging as an issue. I couldn't get anywhere with him, though. He just couldn't. He's like, I can't get 20 years interested in that. No, 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 no. It's not as important an issue. Housing is more important. This is more important. Nobody else is saying this. His class next spring is going to use aging as one of the areas that they can give $50,000 away to the community because we made sure he was at the big thing breakfast. It's amazing how sometimes, now, again, you can plant seeds, you never know when it's going to be the straw to finally get the people's attention, but the big thing was that way in a lot of ways. Um, can't see that real well, but I put that one logo. That's not our senior center logo, but we're the beneficiary of our biggest room race, uh, running race a few years ago. That's a fun logo, our marketing director created for the 10 mile we were the beneficiary of. So Java, our, our AAA, again, not to be mean-spirited about it, the former director did world-class stuff, you know, national awards, Java's one of the best AAAs in the country, they did amazing work, but they pretty much, when they wanted to collaborate, you collaborated on their terms, or if you didn't. You know, you just, you, if you came up with an idea, it just never, it was always his agenda. 
Um, and I think it just kind of narrowed what Charlottesville could be. New director came in, um, was thrilled when I called up and asked her to be a part of the big thing. She right away said, absolutely, we're happy to do this. What can we do and be a part of it? What's the end? And we didn't sign a memorandum. We just agreed with what we were each going to do. Um, there was no animosity about it. Uh, I introduced the speaker. She did the closing. Uh, the head of our local United Way was extraordinarily influential person in our community. She's been there 30 years, incredible woman. Uh, it was on the Charlottesville Tomorrow Board, and we presented there. At the end of it, she very overtly said, it is such a breath of fresh air to see the two of you together presenting and working together in a way. I really applaud the two of you and the effort you're doing to collaborate with that's never happened before. You know, it's been very visible to, to, uh, to the community that we're doing that. The Big Think was the start of that. Um, so Marta's quote, the Big Think was a great example of collaboration between the center and Java. Community saw us working together to educate all about aging demographics and needs. Joint offering of a speaker talking about a discussion-provoking topic was noted by other community leaders and set the stage for future joint meetings and decision makings and influencers. The Big Think was an initial step in announcing that aging is a topic to be discussed and incorporated into the community goals and thoughts. This is more than an event that started the community discussion of what it will take to become an age-friendly community. We've been able to build on this momentum ever since. Um, this is a game changer for our community that I've been waiting for for years at our senior center, our AAA, work as equal partners. Um, we're doing chronic disease self-management together this fall. They got grant money, but we're going to be one of the main sites for it. That didn't happen before. Um, almost every public, if one of us is asked to speak to a group, we're almost always asking the other one to come be a part of it. It's just got, it's, it's beautiful music together. Um, and the other piece that's come out of that um, is Marta and I, what started as a group, there's also the head of hospice of the Piedmont and Alzheimer's Association, our biggest CCRC. Started meeting informally a couple years ago, but it didn't really have any traction. It was just every couple of months. Every couple of months became every four months because people were busy. We, didn't, we weren't really getting anywhere. But we invited all those people and several others from our local Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, um, our local paratransit, uh, and our local village movement, which hasn't gotten off the ground with trying, all of the big thing. And that led to, it's like, shouldn't we be doing more together? And shouldn't it be more than just job in the senior center? Why weren't we invited to take? We would like to have been a part of this. Like, great. I mean, that's never happened before either at the CEO level. So we started having this group of eight, which Brad and John um, uh, paraphrased great, which we are going with, um, group of eight. I propose, how many people have a coalition of aging? Formal network or something in your community, two or three or four, not very many. Love to talk to you afterwards because we are just looking at this, thinking that this is another strategy that's come out of the big thing. But how can we get other people to pay attention? So again, instead of the senior center or Java or the senior center and Java together, just talking about it, that there's this greater group that would then invite business leaders, city and county, university officials to have a, a common voice. We know in the Charlottesville area. Um, we had a major tragedy in our community where a young man with uh, manic depression um, actually attacked his father, our local state senator, terrible, ended up then committing suicide himself too about two years ago. And, and it was all because the mental health system um, did not have a bed for him that night. Damn, I know the family, so it's still been, <laughs> sorry. Um, a group of people, I mean, that's what it took. <clears throat> they created a mental health coalition. And all the major players all of a sudden got together and formed a formal coalition, got some grant money, got some staffing that are making a difference in our community about a major issue. It doesn't affect as many people as aging does, but you know, it's a life or death issue, a life issue for our community. So we use that as a model too, thinking, wow, what, you know, we don't, part of the problem with aging, as we all know, is there's never that tragic moment like that story. <clears throat> or a tsunami, or the types of things that get people's attention. It's just this slow burn. So it's hard to keep people's attention. So we want to figure out a way to get people's attention. We think this coalition is going to be a part of it. So we're trying to position aging as a more prominent issue, serve as a resource for people, um, enhance collaborations um, across the, the community. Um, these are some of our programs, uh, our Second Wind Band and uh, uh, our volunteer program. Raising awareness of aging impact in all of us that we've talked about. 
promote this concept of an age-friendly community. I think that's going to be our number one strategy. We have another meeting next Monday with this fledgling group um, to look at creating that, facilitating community engagement, um, and just increasing the opportunities and the assets, too. That's one of the other things uh, that we're really pushing is how many everybody always talks about the problem of aging. <clears throat> or even I just mentioned tsunami. We have one expert who's always talking about the age of tsunami. I hate that phrase. Tsunami is something you can't plan for, and it's nothing but death and destruction. Who wants, that's not what it is. Aging is something we need to plan for. We know it's coming, and yes, there's some problems, and yes, there's all these opportunities. So an asset-based approach to aging is a big part of what we're pushing as well. And that's just the last shot of some of our folks in my contact information that people need it. I'd actually build an hour more than I thought. <laughs> That's not an hour presentation. Uh, but as I said, it ended up being mm -hmm. a lot more than happened in a year than I even thought. Well, congratulations on all the impact that you've had in a year. Uh, but what have you learned? What What are the, the facts, uh, the visuals, or whatever that cause light bulbs to go on in community leaders' minds about this? But I think one thing, the proverbial getting the outside expert, you know, it's, it's, you know getting the person to walk off the plane is always so much smarter than the person in the community. It really is true. I mean, somebody with street cred and credentials coming into the community and saying, and, and them saying, they don't have a vested interest. He doesn't, he doesn't care if Charles was made from the community, more than Lexington originally. Um, so that, I think, is a, a big plus. Showing that, that one vision that I did have, and it is.